I think next we have Dr. Martha Nance, who will cover some of the aspects, the symptomatic aspects of GHD and go over what the treatment options are and how to manage some of the symptoms. Dr. Nance, do you want to take it away? All right. All right. Hopefully I'm turned on and you can see my screen. Yep, um, looks good. So th thank you so much. I'm Martha Nance. I'm a neurologist and I've been doing work in Huntington's disease for probably 30 plus years um, and, and, and have developed an interest in juvenile onset Huntington's over the years. Um, and really pleased to be able to speak about this. You'll hear some of the things I will say, we'll repeat some of the things you've heard before um, from Cheryl, from uh, Lauren, and I think probably also from Dr. Hennig um, in the last session. So before we can even talk about treating the symptoms of juvenile onset Huntington's disease, uh, one of the first challenges is um, just getting those darn doctors to actually diagnose juvenile onset Huntington's disease. Um, if the pediatrician or the neurologist knows anything about Huntington's disease, they know that it affects movement, thinking, and it leads to mood and behavior symptoms. Um, but, um, you know, any particular symptom um, could be due to lots of other things. So if you, you know, get a lousy grade on a test, it may just be that you didn't sleep well last night, or if you're you know, if you get your feet tangled up on the basketball court, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have juvenile onset Huntington's disease. Um, and, you know, I'm sure many of you have um, uh, faced this kind of scene, um, either on the giving or receiving end in, con in a context that has nothing to do with Huntington's disease. So what doctors really sort of have to um, hang their hat on is, is a real decline in ability. Uh, and usually we look at a decline either in cognitive or in physical abilities. Um, uh, and in kids, it, in my view, it really should not take years to make a diagnosis of ju juvenile onset Huntington's. It may take a year or a year and a half because you want to sort of document what somebody's like at a particular moment and then at some point in time see that there's actually been a decline. In kids, this should be fairly evident because most kids are gaining skills. Um, you know, you're able to run faster the next year. You you move from algebra to uh, calculus. Of course, doing fine in algebra and kind of getting stuck on calculus does not necessarily mean that you have Huntington's disease. So again, we really look for a decline in ability. Um, what we particularly struggle with in the in the neurology clinics is when people have mood or behavioral symptoms as the sort of lead into Huntington's disease um, uh, because we know that behavior and mood symptoms occur in all kinds of people for all kinds of reasons. Um, in my experience, when uh, bad behavior is the first symptom of HD, it, it often is really bad behavior. Um, even so, the, the doctor is going to want to rule other rule other things out first. So, um, if a person is clumsy when they walk or run, uh, they could have multiple sclerosis. They could have a, a brain tumor. They could have other uh, neurologic conditions. And so, um, the minute you diagnose Huntington's disease, you kind of turn off your brain um, in, in terms of thinking about other possibilities. And so, we like to make sure we've thought about those things before we kind of get stuck on. Huntington's disease. So you may have blood tests or MRI scans um, before you get to the, the gene test. And again, I think from the doctor's point of view, you really need to do the gene test at the right time. Um, we are really fearful of diagnosing Huntington's disease prematurely, particularly in a child. Um, if you do that gene test and it turns out that the, the gene, um, Lauren re reviewed the the CAG repeats um, in her presentation, any number that's 36 and above can cause Huntington's disease. Most people with juvenile onset Huntington's disease have repeat numbers of 50 and above. So what if you do that gene test and the child has 42 CAG repeats? That's a repeat number that doesn't usually cause onset of Huntington's disease symptoms at age 10 or 12 or even 18. 
So now you've sort of labeled the person as having Huntington's disease, but that may not really be why they're having the symptoms that you're having. Um, there's a tendency for the clock to start ticking once you diagnose Huntington's disease, and it may not be correct um, in, in a, a patient at age 12 or 15 who has 42 repeats that, that the symptoms they're having have anything to do with those CAG repeats. But let's say the diagnosis has been made. And then um, what I would urge um, you as um, uh, people with JHD, families, friends, extended family, whoever you might be, um, it, it works best if you can build a team that surrounds the PhD, the person with Huntington's disease. The first layer that you can imagine the, the bigger and broader these layers are, the more protected and safe and nourished the patient is. The, the first sort of, um, uh, um, layer surrounding the patient would be the family, the people that live in the home. Around that would be friends or extended family or people in the neighborhood, somebody who might come to your house or whose house you might go to. And then the next layer around that would be um, uh, sort of community programs, school, church, I think are the, the big ones that come to mind. And then of course, there's the medical team, um, which um, for a person with Huntington's disease, uh, with onset in childhood would include a pediatrician, probably a child neurologist or an HD neurologist or both um, a psychiatrist or um, rehab therapist, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, dietitian. Um, often a social worker can help. A, a lot of times, um, one of the nice things about kids is that there's uh, school systems involved, at least in the United States. So they're often um, some of these communities support uh, people like social workers available through the school. Um, all families with Huntington's disease are families under stress. And, um, and so having a counselor or a psychologist, probably anybody and everybody in an HD family uh, uh, should feel that they are permitted to speak to somebody outside the family uh, to get the support that they need both individually and then as a family. It's important not to uh, neglect the health of your teeth. So people with Huntington's disease live for years or a couple decades. And so taking good care of your teeth is important. So uh, annual dental appointments. And then there may be other uh, team members that, that sort of pop in as needed. What about, I'm supposed to talk about treating symptoms. Um, uh, so um, uh, one of the challenges, as was mentioned earlier, is that, that kids with juvenile onset Huntington's disease often do not have chorea, but instead they have dystonia or rigidity, stiffness. Um, and it's a different group of medications that we use to treat stiffness. It's almost sort of the opposite of treating uh, the chorea uh, in, a, um, uh, in, in an adult patient. Um, so drugs that we might use uh, have, these, these are just to name some of them, baclofen, tizanidine, levodopa, um, which actually we think of as a, as a drug we usually use to treat Parkinson's disease, Valium, uh, and similar um, benzodiazepine drugs can be used as muscle relaxants. Um, if there is a particular muscle that's very stiff or tight or in a spasm or a cramp, um, persistently, then you might actually do injections of Botox. Botox is what women use to treat their wrinkles, um, but it really was developed as a treatment for dystonia. Um, there's an overactive muscle that's causing the, the, uh, the limb to uh, be in an awkward, odd looking position or the head to be tilted. And if you um, inject Botox into that muscle that's overly active, it will relax that muscle a little bit and allow the, the limb to be in a more uh, normal posture. Rehabilitation can also help movement symptoms, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, to really work on stretching and range of motion, positioning, splinting. And uh, occupational therapy often thinks about what activities are you trying to do and how can you do these optimally despite having the symptoms that you have. Families can be helpful by encouraging the person who has HD to um, uh, stay physically active and also to ensure that medications are being used correctly. Again, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, kids actually have the advantage um, of a school system that can uh, sort of exist independently. 
that can be helpful in um, uh, uh, keeping the person physically active. Um, oftentimes, we will work with our physical therapist alongside the um, folks at the school to make sure that the um, exercise program is appropriate as the disease progresses. What about cognitive symptoms? Um, uh, there's a whole range of different kinds of cognitive symptoms that people can have. Um, it, often it would be difficulty organizing or initiating activities, difficulty sequencing tasks, ultimately difficulty learning new things. Now, of course, childhood is when you also learn about all kinds of other learning disabilities. Some people have dyslexia, some people have attention deficit. And having Huntington's disease doesn't mean that you can't have some of these other things as well. So um, uh, we often um, either have a patient see a neuropsychologist or again, within the school system, there's often testing that can be done to help uh, define what kinds of learning disabilities there are. We do not have medications that treat dementia um, or the, the decline in cognitive function that comes along as the disease progresses. Obviously, uh, we all know there are treatments for things like attention deficit disorder, methylphenidate or Ritalin being an example. What about uh, non-medication types of treatments? Um, uh, um, people can be taught to utilize their cognitive strengths to help get around their cognitive weaknesses. A, a sort of obvious example would be is if you can't remember something that people says, say that people tell you to do, write it down. And then you have a list of, of um, uh, instructions that it's written down that you can refer back to. Now, I think it's also important, it, it can be really a challenge sometimes to tell is the, is the person with Huntington's disease failing to um, accomplish a task because they really don't have the cognitive ability to do the task, or is it kind of a behavioral thing? Sometimes it's kind of easier to have mom take care of things than to do it yourself. Um, uh, and you get more, um, uh, you know, support if, if it looks like you can't do things and if you're able to do them independently. So helping the family to understand how far to push and, and when to sort of back off and just support and help the person get a, um, uh, get a task accomplished. Um, and of course, this changes over the course of the disease. And then what can the family do? Well, again, you want to help the child uh, who has Huntington's disease to be successful. And I think um, uh, we heard from Cheryl about uh, Megan Sullivan, what an amazing story that was. But I think Cheryl did a brilliant job of positioning Megan for success, um, allowing her to move forward, but being there with a safety net if it didn't go so well, and then redirecting. So if you can't work at a paying job, at least you can do a volunteer job. Um, keeping a regular schedule. Schedules, I think we all dream of how wonderful it'll be to be on vacation, but actually people really do um, well on a sort of regular basis if there's a regular schedule, particularly as the uh, cognitive flexibility diminishes. Um, doing things together. So if a person has trouble doing something, well, I'll do it with them. And, and then they kind of get credit for having accomplished it, even though you sort of helped out. Um, doing a multi-step task is going to be difficult for somebody with Huntington's disease. So having a, an activity that only has a few steps um, can, can be um, easier and more successful. And another thing that we always talk about in the clinic is um, if you think a person is going to need a walker someday, it really is much better to uh, introduce them to the walker before the catastrophe occurs when everybody realizes, oh yeah, you got to use it now, or a wheelchair or a, a augmentative communication device. You will have more ability to learn and understand and train in the use of this new technology um, earlier than, than you would later on uh, as the disease has progressed. And then uh, we really, um, I often try to see my juvenile Huntington's patients in uh, July or August, shortly before school begins in September, so that we can sort of take stock of how things have progressed over the year. Um, and then help the school to set up a new educational program that is appropriate um, for where the patient is at at this point. Um, you do at some point have to think about um, uh, safety. 
Um, uh, you know, if you have a, a young girl with Huntington's disease who's not uh, quite understanding about hygiene and, and safety and so on, uh, I've had it come up where you wonder, should you stay in the middle school longer or do you move to the high school where you've got 18 year old boys there uh, and the person might be vulnerable. Um, uh, and at some point academic achievement may not be the goal. It really may be more of the social interaction and the um, uh, just achieving day-to-day -day successes. I'm gonna um, sort of beat on these behavioral symptoms for a while and mood symptoms. Um, I know you've had a couple lectures already about this, but um, I, I, we probably can't talk too much about it. So in my experience, uh, when people with JHD have had um, behavioral symptoms, um, certainly anybody can have depression or anxiety, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but there are some people whose uh, presentation with juvenile HD is really bad behavior, like burning down the school building, uh, using cocaine at age 12. Um, I had a, a young girl actually with Huntington's disease who was wrapping an electrical cord from the lamp around her two-year-old sibling's neck. Um, this is not subtle bad behavior. This is major bad behavior. And um, when this occurs, the, the first thing you need to think about is safety. So if there is a risk of injury, harm, death, um, dial 911 or whatever the equivalent is in your country, um, access emergency services if you need to, to avoid injury or, or death. For something that's maybe not life-threatening bad behavior, but, but sort of moderately bad behavior, I often talk about um, coming up with a, a plan B for the family um, so that when you see this behavior starting, you say, time out, plan B, Oftentimes it might be something like you go to another room for a set period of time, or you call a neighbor to come over. Um, I had one patient with adult onset Huntington's where, <laughs> believe it or not, when things started to boil over, um, he had a, a bus ticket and he would be, um, uh, he would take the bus to his mother's house yeah, and that would calm him down. Um, Severe behavior issues may require strong medications. It may require a psychiatric hospitalization. And if this behavior is persistent and it's directed at other people in the family, um, at some point, a family may have to make the very difficult decision as to what's uh, best for everybody in the family. And placement outside the home occasionally might be necessary for somebody where the behavior is, is hard to control and really directed at other family members. Uh, I think I said it before, I'll say it again, all Huntington's disease families are under stress. Um, so um, uh, just don't be shy about asking for help, um, asking for a counselor or looking for a psychologist. Adolescence is a time of um, emotional turmoil anyway, which will only be magnified by Huntington's disease. What are some of the challenges of adolescence? I don't, maybe I shouldn't have to tell people all this. I, you know, you all know this. You get pressure from all directions. Your parents want you to grow up to, you know, do whatever dad did, and your teachers want you to get an A on the test, and your teammates want you to score a goal, and your peers want you to go smoke behind the school building, and your siblings want to beat up with on you if you're a bigger sibling, or beat up on you if you're a younger sibling. You know, you get pressure from all directions. And at the same time, you're starting to actually become who you are, which may not be at all what any of these people want you to be. Um, I was struck as I was writing the slide, I, I mentioned sexual awareness. You know, a hundred years ago, it, it just, there sort of wasn't any decision making. If you were a guy, you would marry a woman. If you were a woman, you'd marry a guy. It doesn't really matter what you thought or felt. That you might be sad or feel lonely, but, but that was what you did. 50 years ago, I think you were starting to be allowed to say, oh, I'm a girl, but I like girls better than guys, or I'm a guy, I prefer uh, guys. Now we have even the added step of saying, well, although I've been thought to be a girl, I feel more comfortable um, in, in the skin of a, of, a of a man or vice versa. 
not to say that these things are bad, but holy smokes, there's just a lot more thinking that you have to do about your own sexuality than what, what was sort of permitted or allowed or needed 100 years ago. There's mind altering drugs that, that uh, you know, do you use them? Do you use them a lot? Do you use them socially? How do they affect you? There's just this desire to break free from where you've been, your family. Um, and it really is difficult to both ask for and, and to receive help. So um, uh, what are the, the psychiatric conditions or symptoms or diseases that might happen? Um, there is a whole range of stuff, depression, anxiety, irritability or impulsiveness, OCD, sleep disturbance, hallucinations, PTSD, post-traumatic stress. Um, eating disorder or body image disorder, drug and alcohol abuse, uh, gender dysphoria, where you don't feel comfortable with your assigned gender, um, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, personality disorders. There's a lot of um, psychiatric symptoms, um, some of which are sort of seen in people with Huntington's disease in a, uh, fairly frequently. So depression, anxiety, irritability, explosiveness, obsessive compulsive kind of perseverating sleep disturbance and in a minority of people uh, kind of paranoid or, or uh, psychotic thinking well a lot of these symptoms are things you might see just from or experience just from being in a stressed family depression anxiety irritability sleep disturbance ptsd drug and alcohol abuse um, and a number of these symptoms are things that start to emerge in adolescence or young adulthood anyway, that really don't have anything to do with, with Huntington's disease, but may occur in a person at risk for Huntington's disease, um, whether or not they have the, the abnormal gene. And if they do have the abnormal gene, those symptoms may be more intense um, than they might otherwise be. So, you know, the psychiatrist, the psychologist, the counselor has a, a big role to play in the, in the management of um, a child with Huntington's disease. And also for those of you in the HDO community um, who are at risk uh, for HD or who have a sibling uh, or a parent with Huntington's disease, don't be shy about asking for help. Um, Suicide, uh, and I'm, I'm sure Bonnie probably talked about this, but up to 20% of people with Huntington's have thoughts of suicide. About four to seven percent of deaths in HD affected individuals are due to suicide. There are known factors that increase the suicide risk, not, not just in relation to HD, but just in general, depression, uh, social isolation, financial problems, aggressive or impulsive tendencies, illness, substance abuse, adverse child, uh, childhood experience. Interestingly, a family history of suicide uh, and then having access to means of, of committing suicide. So again, please talk, um, call 911 if you're feeling suicidal, uh, remove the guns, lock up the medications. Um, I, I'm gonna pause for just a second and say that this uh, kind of became personal for me about a few weeks ago when uh, one of my dear colleagues I've worked with for 30 years um, who had a daughter who was, let's say she was maybe 30 something or late 20s. And um, she, I think, had been known by the family to drink maybe more than she should. Uh, but she had an episode uh, a month or six weeks ago where she was drinking, uh, came home intoxicated, her husband, uh, they didn't have any children, husband put her to bed and came back an hour later and she was not breathing, she was dead. Um, you know, whether she intended to die, whether she um, uh, took it over, I, I don't know, or whether she's, I think the family has called it uh, um, acute alcohol poisoning. Um, if you're drinking or using drugs on a daily basis, if you are um, in trouble, um, speak up. Um, I assigned all my staff the job of uh, go talk to three people and ask them how they're doing. Uh, with that tone of voice, it means you're actually listening. It's not just how are you doing? I'm fine. Let's talk about the latest ball game. But how are you really doing? And, um, and let's talk about it if you're not doing so well. 
Um, please ask for help. So a couple other things about um, uh, juvenile onset Huntington's disease. Um, people with juvenile onset Huntington's disease need normal pediatric care. They need their annual physical, they need their immunizations and so on. Um, nutrition is particularly important for people with Huntington's disease. Um, there's not a specific diet that I recommend. I really just talk about healthy eating. You know, eat your fruits and vegetables, but you need some meat too, and you need some, you know, I, humans are omnivores. So eating a, a healthy diet. Now, sometimes it's challenging to figure out how to prepare food uh, in the context of somebody who has more trouble chewing and swallowing. And that's where both the speech pathologist and the dietitian uh, in my clinic are, um, are really key members of our team. Um, if you're having trouble chewing and swallowing, ask to see a speech pathologist. If you don't know what kind of food to eat, ask to speak with a dietitian. Um, and then, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but you got to make it okay to talk about juvenile onset Huntington's disease. What a wonderful advocate Megan was, you know, when stopped by the police, not to, to be scared and cower, but to take that as an opportunity to, to uh, educate people about Huntington's disease, build a community, build a, a bigger community that has more awareness. And then participate in research. You know, juvenile HD is... is Every single family with juvenile HD feels like they're all alone. They're the only patient in their only family in their community dealing with juvenile HD. The Join HD project is a um, an opportunity to stand up and be counted, to join together uh, as the little uh, uh, sign up on our break room says. You know, individually we are a drop, but together we are a river. So we we will move more quickly um, uh, and. Um, with really more detail, the more people who get involved in, in research projects. You're correct that there are not any gene therapy trials that are yet targeting children, but that's partly because we don't know where the children with HD are, and you need to have enough of them to actually do this study. So stand up and be counted, um, participate in the, in the joint HD study. What about late stage um, juvenile onset HD? And, um, you know, inevitably people do reach the late stage until we find a cure. Um, a couple things that maybe um, uh, are fairly common in late stage HD um, seizures or um, um, what you might call epilepsy, recurrent tendency to have seizures can occur in some people with HD. It's often a minor issue, but it can be a major issue that really requires the, the help of a um, pediatric epilepsy expert. Fortunately, pediatric epilepsy experts are relatively easy to find, actually easier to find than a pediatric HD specialist. Um, but you know that would require medication and which medication, there are a lot of different seizure medications and it would just depend on the details of that particular person. Severe dystonia, that twisting or, or uh, stiff, uh, odd, awkward posturing uh, can become quite prominent and can be painful. Um, weight loss as a person, as their ability to chew and swallow declines or interest in eating declines. And then there's just sort of the declining cognition, the declining ability to kind of function and ultimately to interact. It's, uh, towards the end, people really may require professional help as with Megan, uh, moving uh, outside the home to a place where, where nursing care is available on a 24 hour basis. In the um, uh, late stages, hospice, or in the US, there's a growing um, field of palliative care, which is sort of maybe before you, hospice we think of as being really towards the end, the last few months. Palliative care really could enter in at anywhere along the way if you feel like the focus of medical care is not enough on the comfort of the individual. Uh, nobody with juvenile and said HD should die alone. Nobody should die with pain. Um, and that's where, and if you feel like things are moving that direction, jump up and down and ask for hospice, ask for palliative care, ask for specialists to help with the pain. Um, 
Uh, and I, I have a Megan. Um, so, so you know, we, we heard in length the, the story of Megan earlier. Um, my Megan equivalent is Ellie. Um, Ellie was diagnosed with Huntington's disease at age 12, and she too proceeded to just absolutely make the most of it. Um, she organized a kickball tournament at her school to raise money for Huntington's disease. She uh, lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but went down to um, Iowa, 500 kilometers away um, every year for six years, or maybe it was eight, to participate in a research study where she had MRI scans and cognitive tests and blood tests and spinal taps. And um, she kept going until they told her she was too old because she wasn't a kid anymore. Um, she spoke at a national conference. She actually spoke at our Huntington study group uh, conference about the importance of participating in research. When Nature Magazine, the preeminent uh, scientific uh, research magazine wanted to have a special edition about Huntington's disease, they had a little article about juvenile HD. And this is actually the picture of Ellie that was in Nature Magazine. Um, you can, uh, her story was, um, uh, on the HDO website section on juvenile onset HD. Um, one of the remarkable things about Ellie is she was just so um, uh, pretty and polite. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I know. She always wore a skirt to her doctor's appointment. I don't know anybody under the age of 30 who ever wears a skirt and certainly not to a doctor's appointment. And the last words I ever heard her say were, thank you as she was leaving clinic one day. Um, she always said thank you when she was leaving. Uh, and like Megan, when she died last year, um, her, her uh, contributions to the HD community didn't stop at her death. Uh, she too donated her brain to research. So we've got two remarkable young ladies that you've heard about today. And I, I hope that that um, give, gives you the, um, I don't know, the confidence, the reassurance that there's life to be lived after a diagnosis of HD. And uh, what really makes a difference is not the fact that we're all gonna die, but what you do between now and then. Um, so I will stop there and maybe we can have some questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Nance, for that wonderful presentation. I think we have one question so far. Uh, Joshua asks, can you explain why some people don't deteriorate as much as others in the context of ZHD? Yeah, so, you know, I would say that this is true for not just juvenile onset HD, but adult onset HD too, that the people, you know, some people seem to progress very quickly, other people seem to progress more slowly. We don't we clearly don't have a full understanding of that. And it's probably a multifactorial thing. There may be other genes that you have inherited from your parents. Let's say on the other side of the family, you have genes for long life. Everybody on your mother's side of the family lives to be a hundred. Um, and everybody on your father's side of the family who doesn't have HD also lives to be a hundred. Well, you have probably inherited genes for long life that may whatever that is, <laughs> that may sort of influence the, the, uh, the damage or destruction, may mitigate some of the damage caused by the abnormal Huntington gene. You can't control what genes you have, but what you can control is, um, I always say there are six things that you are in control of. Um, eat right, drink enough fluids, exercise, rest when you need rest, do things that you love to do with people that you care about. And you can't help thinking that if you're doing all, if you can check all six of those boxes, you can't help thinking that you're going to do better than if you're living alone in a trailer with no help from anybody and eating Cheetos and, and uh, microwave pizza. Um, so, so the things that you can control, control them and, you know, live proudly, um, be, um, engaged in the community, um, surround yourself, um, try to, uh, you know, again, you can't change people's personalities. Some of us are, are uh, more, um, you know, loners than others and other people just sort of, I don't know, people just gravitate around them. Um, so the, the people who do best are the ones who, who have these layers of support around them. 
Yeah, absolutely. I definitely agree with that, especially since HD and GHD are diseases that rob one of uh, people's agency. So it's important to do the things you want to do. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. There's a lot of appreciation for the presentation. I don't think there are any other questions. Do you have any final words for anyone going through a GHD or their parents, caregivers, maybe? <laughs> well, I, I will reiterate. You know, stand up and be counted. Um, join, join HD. Um, this is the, the. We really need this. We need to know where people with GHD are. Uh, and the perk of participating in the study is that you will become connected with each other and then you will not feel so alone. So please do join, join HD. All right. Thank you, Dr. Nance. And remember, guys, please join, join HD. It's a wonderful initiative. Okay, I think that's it for today. Thank you again, Dr. Nance. We have some other sessions going on in different time zones. So if you're interested, you can join over there, specifically for people in Australia, New Zealand, and India, more of the Asia, Asia Pacific time zones. So if you're in that part of the world, that might be useful for you. I think with that, we're done. Thank you everyone again for attending. Thank you for your wonderful questions. And thanks again, Dr. Nance.